Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. This is college algebra, right? Okay, good. Just make sure I'm in the right place. <coughs> uh, so, this is college algebra. I'm the instructor, Dr. Brady McCary. Uh, a few remarks about how the course is run. Uh, so, in the first place, this is lecture section uh, 002. And we, we meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday at this time. So, that's, that's probably obvious, since you're, obvious to you since you're here. Uh, besides that, there's also an exam section. It is section 701. Uh, and it meets twice. Once for the midterm exam and once for the final exam. So I say that because I, I can't remember what the schedule says, but the, 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 the exam section meets like on a Thursday or something, I don't know. Thursday, uh, but it doesn't meet this week. So if you if you try and go to that room, you, you'll you'll be alone. <laughs> okay. So fine. Good. And the best way to contact me is by email. My email address is Brady. Dot. At utdallas.edu. So you have a UTD email address, I have a UTD email address, and um, all of us probably have other email addresses like with Gmail or whatever, what have you. That's great. Uh, however, university policy is that any communication that you have with me or any of your instructors for that matter is considered official university business and uh, if you send me an email from your Yahoo account, I'll just ignore it uh, because I have to by policy. So make sure you're sending me your emails to my UTD email address from your UTD email address. Uh, my office is FA 2.402. So on campus, there's three buildings that have founders in their name. We're in one of them. This building is called Founders. Uh, and it, its short initialism is FO. Uh, my office is in Founders Annex, which is a completely different building. But it's just one building that way, one building to the west. Uh, the reason why I point this out is because it's slightly confusing because uh, this building is FO. And there is an FO 2.402. And there is a math instructor in FA 2.402. But it's not me. Uh, I'm in FA. Good. Today I'll send you a link to the syllabus. It is online. Feel free to print it. Uh, the message will be sent over Blackboard. Uh, since this is the spring semester, it's likely that every one of you has been here at least one semester. Uh, if so, Blackboard is e-learning, the thing that you have used before. Uh, other, otherwise, you'll just get, have to get used to it. There's this thing called e-learning. Most of your courses use it. I'll send you a message over Blackboard. Uh, fine. So you'll need a scientific scientific uh, <clears throat> non-graphing non-algebra. What do I mean by that? Uh, there are some calculators that can actually do a great many algebraic tasks, like you can type in an equation and say, solve it for me, and it can do it. 
which is terrific. However, they're not allowed. Uh, calculator. Calculator. So the, the one that I recommend is a TI what? A TI 30X2S. These are sold basically everywhere, including the bookstore and Walmart and Amazon and probably everywhere else you could possibly imagine. They cost about, at this time, I think on the order of like $12 before tax. Okay, any question about that? I, I'll be glad to look at it after, after class. Pro probably there's not a lot of difference. The again, the only requirement is that it can't plot anything and it can't solve any, any equations of any kind. Good. Uh, fine. So the way the course will be graded is as follows. So in the first place, we will have online homeworks. So one online homework per lecture. So This class is scheduled to meet, I think, something like 42 times, right? Because we meet for three times a week for approximately 16 weeks, but there's some, some closures and whatever. So about 42. So there's going to be about 42 online homeworks. Uh, this will be uh, done using WebAssign. <coughs> which is a website that you go to uh, and log in and say, oh, there's my homework number 18 for college algebra, and you do that. Uh, terrific. So notably, uh, this is the one thing in this course, the one additional thing that you have to pay for, right? Assuming you already have a legitimate calculator. Uh, so this, this costs the cost to use WebAssign if you haven't already paid like a, a long-term one because other, other classes use WebAssign. So if, it may be the case that you already paid a lifetime subscription or whatever to WebAssign. But at any rate, it's like $32, something like that. Uh, there's two ways to pay for WebAssign. One of them is to go to the bookstore and purchase a license number. If you do that, if you do that, be sure, be sure, be sure to purchase one that corresponds to the publisher of our textbook, OpenStax. So to be clear, there's lots of different, there's lots of different textbook publishers. OpenStax is one of them. Another example is Wiley. Another example is Cengage. And the way WebAssign does business is you is that they, they tie the license to the publisher. So if you go to the bookstore and you're not careful, you could end up buying, instead of, instead of buying a license for an, an OpenStax one, you might buy it for some other pu publisher, then, then you'll have to go back and return it or whatever. It'd be a big pain. The other way to, to do it is that uh, there, there's a 12-day grace period where you log on to WebAssign and says, oh, well, you have 12 days before uh, that you can do your homework assignments until you have to have a license. If you want to buy a license right now, you can click here. Well, you can click there and input your credit card and, and, and do it that way. Uh, and there's no way you could make an, uh, an error there, right? You click there, <laughs> it's going to work. Any question about that? So the way that they'll be due 
is that we meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So corresponding to the Monday lecture, that is to say today, there will be uh, an online homework due Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Corresponding to the Wednesday lecture, there'll be an online homework due Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. And corresponding to the Friday lecture, there'll be an online homework due Thursday at 11.59 p.m. One minute before midnight. Any question? Okay, besides those, there's also uh, written exercises. So one of the kinds of written exercise is uh, homework, which you download, print, and turn in at the beginning of lecture. According to the schedule, Monday to Monday, that means that, that, uh, well, today is a Monday, we're going to go over some algebra stuff, I'll post some homeworks, they'll be due uh, the next Monday, seven days from now. Of course, there's an asterisk on that because as it happens, uh, seven days from now is Martin Luther King Day and the university is closed, so we won't have lecture seven days from now. As a result, <laughs> it's unfortunate, but the very first written homeworks have an exception <laughs> that instead of being due on Monday, wh where they should be due, they're going to be due Wednesday. Okay, but otherwise, we should be with more or less without disruption. Monday to Monday, Wednesday to Wednesday, Friday to Friday. Okay. Uh, 5.2.2. There'll be a one, almost always one, but maybe two. exercise quiz at the end of every lecture starting next week. And it will be over the homework you turned in. There's also exams, 5.2.3. Exams are going to be like quizzes in the sense that there's, you'll sit down and do uh, some exercises, but it has the, there's, there's another nice part to it. And that is, by the time of the midterm, for example, uh, by the time of the midterm, I didn't count, but you will have, at that point, taken something like 15 or 20 quiz exercises. I don't, I don't know, I didn't count. Uh, so you will have taken uh, that many quiz exercises, and uh, there will be an opportunity for you to improve your score on those quiz exercises, because it may be the case that on, on quiz exercise 11, maybe you didn't do so great. 
uh, maybe because you didn't know what was going on, you didn't understand the question, or maybe you weren't here, I don't know. Uh, you can, you can uh, improve your grade on, on such exercises uh, on the exam. As a result, um, there are no makeups for, for quizzes. So, um, besides these three things, online homework, written exercises, uh, there is also attendance and participation. So the way your attendance is measured is as follows. That we have homework due every lecture, and it's due at the beginning of the lecture. So uh, if you walk in late, you won't be able to turn in your homeworks. Fine. Uh, furthermore, there is a quiz at the end of every lecture. So if you're not here, you can't take the quiz. So that gives me two measurements for each of you. Uh, a measurement of whether or not you were here at the beginning and another measurement of whether or not you were here at the end. So using uh, these two measurements, uh, I'll calculate your attendance and then your participation will be uh, in, in fact quite similar to your, to your attendance, uh, but it will be uh, the percentage of all uh, assignments that you attempted. So that includes things like online homework and things like that. Any question about the, the graded elements of the class? Yes? So if we're absent for a class, how would that affect our quiz and uh, written exercise grade? Would well, you, you'll, re you'll receive zeros for all uh, affected ones, unless it's a university approved absence, uh, and in such a case, we'll make a different arrangement. But if you're, if you're absent, without university approved excuse, then you just receive zeros. So, say for example, you're absent next Friday. Uh, then you wouldn't be able, by next Friday, I mean Friday that's uh, five plus seven days from now or whatever. Uh, then you wouldn't be able to take the quiz, so you'd receive a zero. Uh, then, on the midterm, uh, each, of, each of you will be allowed to uh, imp improve your grade on, I haven't decided, like maybe something like up to six uh, quiz exercises, and that would be one of your six. Was there, do you have a question? Is there a book that we're supposed to do our homework on as well, or is it? So, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was about to forget. This is the book. Uh, when, I, when I send you a link to the syllabus, uh, it'll be in there. So you don't need to frantically try and copy this down. But at any rate, uh, the publisher is OpenStax, and it's called College Algebra. So this, this textbook is uh, nice in the sense that uh, a physical copy is actually quite cheap. I think, I think if it, this, a physical copy just like this costs like, I don't know, like $50, which is cheap for a textbook. You know, $50 is not, is not, is not a trivial amount of money, but it's, that's cheap for a textbook. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, the publisher uh, publishes uh, a free copy of the PDF that you can download for free. So you need not uh, purchase a copy of the textbook to have access to it, as long as you have access to a computer. And you do, because as a result of being a UTD student, you can go into any UTD computer lab. But some people just like having a physical copy of the textbook, and I'm one of those people. Other questions? So any questions before we get to college algebra topics? Okay. <coughs> so a remark about sets of numbers. So the first set of numbers that we're going to call out by name are called the natural numbers. They are denoted with a fancy looking N. 
and they contain the positive integers. One, two, three, four, etc. So the reason for the fanciness, uh, that's just a regular n, but the leg that's furthest to the left uh, is shaped like a box. The reason for that uh, is that when you, uh, historically, when you, when you print the set of natural numbers in a textbook or in a math paper, it's printed in bold, but I don't have a bold uh, hand or pencil. Uh, so the way you denote that the character is in bold is with that fanciness there. Good. So those are the natural numbers. Uh, can someone give us a number that's not natural? Negative one. That's a number. It's not natural. Okay. So natural numbers, that's not all of them. That's not all of the conceivable numbers. So the next set is called the whole numbers. are denoted with a fancy W. And they're almost the same as the natural numbers, except they also include zero. So notably, I'd like for you to observe that every natural number is a whole number. Is the converse true? No. Nope. What's a whole number that's not natural? Zero. zero. Good. Uh, fine. And then even, uh, you gave the example negative one. Is negative one a whole number? No. It's not. So now we need an even bigger set. These are called the integers. Okay, so if natural numbers are denoted with n, and the set of whole numbers is denoted with w, then what are the integers going to be uh, denoted as? <laughs> you would think i, but it's not. It's a z. Obviously, right? So that's 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, etc. And for the curious, why z? Why should it be z? Uh, the, the reason is because when these conventions were being set down, they were being set down in German-speaking regions in Europe, and the German uh, word for number is Zahlen, which starts with a Z. Okay, well, thanks, German-speaking folks, uh, centuries ago. So there we have it. Uh, notice that every whole number is an integer. Is it the case that, that is the converse true? Is every integer a whole number? No. What's, an, what's a number that is an integer but not a whole number? Negative one. Okay. Four. Now, can someone give us a number that is, well, a number, but, not, but it's not an integer? Well, what about the square root of 100? <laughs> I'm just being, I'm just being difficult. Uh, how about something like three and a half? Right? Three and a half. That's not, uh, that's not uh, an integer. So, this set is called the rationals. They're denoted with Q, <laughs> obviously, for quotient. And it is the set of all p over q such that p and q are in the integers and q is not zero. So <laughs> this stuff that I just wrote uh, is referred to as set builder notation and the state of Texas assures me that you're quite familiar with it. Uh, but the state of Texas has known to be mistaken from time to time. So I'll remind you of some of these things. So in particular, this is the one that seems to trip up most students in college algebra. This vertical bar is pronounced out loud as such that. So 
So to render that statement in English, the rationals is defined as the set of all expressions of the form p divided by q, where p and q are both integers, and the denominator is not zero. Okay. So, some examples of things that are in the in the rationals. So, what's an example of a rational number? Three over one. Three over one. Notably, uh, 3 over 1 is an integer, isn't it? Yep. And do you observe that every integer is rational? Because you take your favorite integer, say 13, 14. Uh, is 13, 14 a rational number? Yes. Yeah. Because you could write 13, 14 as 13, 14 over 1. Or you could write it as 28, 26 over 2. So you could do it a multitude of ways. Uh, how about how about 3.5? Is that rational? Yes. Yes. If it is rational, then you have to tell me how you could represent it as the ratio of two integers. Okay. Seven over two. Very good. Mm, how about uh, how about I don't know, negative eight over five. Is that rational? Yes, it is, uh, because y you could you could say well it's negative eight, and then that and then that divided by five. Or you could also say it's eight, and that divided by negative five, and you could do a, a lot of things. Okay, so how about some things that are not in the rationals? So what's a number? Can anyone give us an example of a number that is a number but not uh, rational? Pi. Pi is not rational for reasons that are well beyond the scope of the class. But there is no, well, there are no two integers that you can say pi is equal to this one divided by that one. And that's the subject of, of <laughs> kind of a funny bit of history. Uh, you know, you can get you can you can get successively better and better approximations of pi by using bigger and bigger ratios of integers. So an, one example of an approximation of pi is 22 over 7. That that's an approximation. Uh, but you can do even better by taking bigger numerators and bigger denominators. People tried to find the rational expression for pi for a long time. Lots of people did lots of scribble work, uh, and then uh, it came to pass that a mathematician proved that it wasn't possible <laughs> to do it. So, and all those people just said, oh, okay, and they just stopped doing that. Okay, another example of something that's not rational is the square root of two, or for that matter, the square root of p for any prime p. By the way, what does prime mean? Right. So it, they've got to be naturals, positive integers, whose integer factors include what? One, itself. one in itself and no, and no others. And furthermore, it has to be greater than one. Because notice that one, the integer factors of one, the, the natural integer factors of one are one and one. But one's not prime by definition. What's the smallest prime? Two is the smallest prime. Uh, then the next one is three, and then five, and then there's some others after that. Okay, good. Uh, fine. So now we need uh, a name for, well, I'll say it like this, pi and square root of two and all those other numbers that are numbers but aren't rational are important. So now we need a name for a set that contains all the numbers that we could possibly uh, want to deal with. And what, uh, what's that, the name of that one? Irrational. Not irrationals. Those are the numbers that are not rational. Real? Reals. And these are denoted with fancy R. 
And this is, uh, I have to write it in scare quotes, all of the numbers. Including pi and things like that. I have to write it in scare quotes because to a mathematician and in a math class, all has a very specific meaning. And uh, in this class, we don't have the tools necessary for me to explain exactly what is meant by all. But you can take my word for it when I say that if we're dealing with the set of real numbers, there aren't any that are left out. Uh, fine. Uh, also, as a matter of foreshadowing, uh, I want to let you know that the name Reels is a joke. That I, we don't have the context for, for you to get the joke just yet. Uh, but in a few lectures, you will have enough context to get the joke. For now, I just want you to know that every time I say Reels or I hear someone else say the Reels, I laugh a little bit inside. And uh, I hope that you'll laugh a little bit too uh, soon. Six. So I want to, you to observe the thing that we've been saying all along, and that is that the naturals are a subset of the whole numbers. So this symbol means subset. That is to say that every natural is a whole number. But the inclusion goes all the way uh, the inclusion goes all the way down. That is to say that every natural is a whole number, every whole number is an integer, every integer is a rational, and every rational is a real. <clears throat> Any question about this? So, uh, I say this, uh, because from now on, I'm going to free, freely use these symbols. And you, you need to know their names and what they mean, because there's not enough time for me to remind you every time I write it down. And so I'll, I'll use that one, and that one, and that one, blah, blah. Okay, so a, a remark about the number line. So the reals are visually represented as a line, as a horizontal line. And it is increasing to the right. So, uh, here's zero. And uh, zero is very important, and as it happens, as it happens, uh, often when something is important, it has more than one name. So another name for this uh, is called the origin. So uh, going to the right, values are getting bigger. Going to the left, values are getting smaller. Uh, the values which are to the left of the origin, these are called the negative numbers. The values to the right of the origin. No, su no surprise, I suspect, when I say that these are called the positive numbers. And then, 
given any real, I can ask you about its sign, its S-I-G-N. And most of the time when I say, uh, so when I say S-I-G-N, I mean positive or negative. And furthermore, you might be asking, well, why is he spelling it? <laughs> the answer is that in a math class, uh, there is another uh, word pronounced sign, but it is spelled S-I-N-E, and it's related to trigonometry, which you might not be familiar with, but maybe you are. Uh, as a result, every time I say, I want to say sign, whatever it is, I spell it. So, sorry, that's one of my quirks you'll have to get used to. So, uh, given any uh, number, I can ask you for its SIGN. So, what's the SIGN of 1,314? Positive. And what's the SIGN of negative 8? Negative. negative. Uh, no real surprises there, but here's, here's maybe moderate surprise. What's the SIGN of zero? Undefined. Doesn't have one. Doesn't have one. Okay, it is, is the, the reason, a reason, visually, is that to be positive means to be to the right, strictly to the right of zero. To be negative means to be strictly to the left of zero. So is zero to the right of zero? No, so it's not positive. Is zero to the left of zero? No, so it's not negative. So it's not either one of these. So it, it doesn't have a, it doesn't have an SIGN. Okay, if we were to mark out some values, say like one, two, three, four. So if that if those are one two three four then what's this one? Negative one. Negative one. Negative two. Negative three. Negative four. Okay, then I could ask you. I could ask you to plot. That is to say, mark on the number line. I'd like for you to plot square root of 2. Well, in order to be able to do that, you've got to know approximately how big the square root of 2 is. So how, how This is one of the numbers that it, it's in your interest to memorize the first two or so decimal places. Not quite. That's, cl that's close. So at any rate, even if you don't have it memorized yet, you should memorize it. But even if you didn't, you could, your calculator could rescue you and you could ask for the square root of to 1.41 is what it uh, starts with. So 1.41. And there's other other digits, but we don't need them for this exercise. So, notably, I'd like for you to observe that because we know the square root of 2 starts with 1.41, you can tell me what integers it falls in between. Okay, so in particular, this should be between one and two. Now, uh, if it was exactly 1.5, it's not. But what if, if it if it if it were exactly 1.5, then where would it be? Halfway between 1.2. It'd be exactly halfway between 1 and 2. That's where it would be. If it was 1.5, but it's not. It's 1.41. So as a result, what can we say? Somewhere between left and center. Right. It's going to be just a little bit left to center, right? Okay, so we can we can mark it out pretty good there. So between one and two, so that's one and two right there. So there's 1.5 at least according to my eyeball. So it couldn't be there. It's got to be a little bit to the left. So like that maybe. 
I'm not going to get out a ruler and measure. Uh, but if you were, if I were to ask you to do this and you responded with a mark that was not between one and two, you'd just receive a zero because that's an, that you have utterly misunderstood the concept. Okay. Uh, how about uh, how about say pi? Well, this is another number that's in your interest to memorize the first couple digits. What? Good. 3.14 ish, right? Dot, dot, dot. So, what integers is it between? Three and four. It's got to be between three and four. And then, is it closer to three or four? Closer to three, right? So just eyeballing it about right there, maybe. Okay, how about negative pi? Well, that'd be negative 3.14, right? Dot, dot, dot. So how does it work? It means I go to negative, just like I went to 3 and then moved a little bit to the right, should I go to 3, should I go to this negative 3 and then move a little bit to the right right there? Well, I moved to the right for this one, though. Ah, so let's have a look here. So um, for this, this, this value, uh, what integers is it between? Negative 4 and negative 3, right? Those are the integers it's between. Look at the position I'm indicating. What two integers am I, am I between? Negative 3 and negative 2. So this is, this is wrong, not in a little way. This is wrong in a categorical way. This is wrong in a, you have severely misunderstood something here. So between negative three and negative four is over here. Any question about this? <clears throat> okay, good. <coughs> So let n be in the whole numbers, x be in the reals, a comment about addition. So I'm going to skip two lines here. I'm going to skip one line and then another line because I'm going to write stuff there in a second. Uh, but for now, I'm going to start writing on the third line and write that 2 multiplied by x is, well, that's defined as x plus x. You take two copies of x and add them all up. Also, I'd like for you to observe that at the present time, the horizontal space on either side of the equal sign is uneven, not symmetric, which is totally not my style. Uh, so I'm probably going to write something in there in a minute. Uh, in that case, what is the definition of 3 multiplied by x? Right. Make three copies of x, add them all up. I think without much surprise, I could say that, well, then what's 4, four times x? Four copies of x, add them all up. Okay. Well, what about something like 1, 3, 1, 4 multiplied by x? What does that mean? It means you make 1,314 copies of x, add them all up. So that means x plus x plus dot, 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 plus x. And then how many times do we need, would we need to write it out? Right. So uh, x appears. one three one four times which is the reason for the language three times x because how many times does this x appear three times three times x fine so now 
here's the, what, the place where some students get a little bit disturbed. So then in that case, what's 1 times x? It's just x, right? You take one copy of x and add them all up. That's a little disturbing to say until you get <laughs> used to talking like a mathematician. Then, OK, what's 0 times x then? Now, wait a second. If, if 2x is make two copies of x and add them all up, and 3x is make three copies of x and add them all up, then how do we make sense of this? 0x is you make how many copies of x? And then you add them all up, right? So what's happening is that the definition is slightly incorrect, and now I can fix the horizontal space. So the, the real definition is that this is all, there's a 0 here, so 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus. So the real definition of n times x, when n is a whole number and x is real, this is 0 plus x plus x plus dot 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 plus x, and there's n of them. Now, uh, that zero that was lurking there all the time, with regard to addi addition, zero is so, Im so important that it has a special name. It is called the additive identity. It's called the additive identity. Among, among other reasons, it's called the additive identity because uh, adding zero is the same as doing nothing. So you take your favorite number, 13, 14, add zero to it, and that's the same as doing nothing. So the additive identity, fine. So now for multiplication. Multiplication. Well, again, I'm going to skip two lines and start on the third line, but I'll, I'll come back around to it. So what's the definition of x squared? What does that mean? X x. Right. It means make two copies of x, but instead of adding them together, what do we do? Multiply. You multiply them. Notice that there's currently asymmetric horizontal space. Uh, x cubed, what's that? Right, three copies of x, multiply them all together. Okay, then what's, uh, in that case, going up now, what's x to exponent 1? Just x, because you make one copy of x and multiply them all together. But, in that case, this is the case where a lot of students get a little bit nervous. What's x to exponent 0? It's 1. It's 1 uh, because the real definition actually is, is x cubed does not, does not mean make three copies of x and multiply them all together. It means take 1 and take three copies of x and multiply them all together. So there's a 1 here, and there's a 1 there, and there's a 1 there, and there's a 1 there. Dot, dot, dot. So x to exponent n is really 1 multiplied by x, multiplied by x, multiplied by x, multiplied by dot, 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 x. And there's n of these x's. Now. Just like 0 was special in regard to addition, 1 is also special with regard to multiplication. What is the special name of 1? Yes. 1 is the multiplicative identity. Multiplicative identity. Now, one slight caveat, 
needs to be said, and that is for, for this specific one right here, this is true for x not equal to 0. That is to say that what if I was what if I were to ask you what's five divided by zero? It's undefined, right? So for example, like five divided by thirteen, uh, sorry, five divided by fifteen, that's one third, right? You could simplify it to that. And then I could ask, well, what's five divided by zero? And then you'd have to tell me that this is undefined, because it's not because it isn't. And if I were to ask, say, uh, well, what's uh, 3 to exponent 4? Well, you could work it out and get it to be 81. And if I were to ask, well, what, what about uh, 1, 3, 1, 4 to exponent 0? What's that? That's 1. What about uh, 0 to exponent 0? It's undefined. It's not something you can do. So just like 5 divided by 0 is undefined, 0 to exponent 0 is also undefined in the same kind of way. Okay, and that's it for today. So I hope you have a nice Monday. <laughs>